good to gather together in the house of the Lord always, and especially with the saints of God who've come here to receive from God. I want to uh, share some thoughts here on some principles that uh, we have from the Reformation as a result of the Reformation. And the five solas that are listed on the front of your bulletin, I want to go through those uh, at the last part of the presentation. But um, they're a different order. I've seen them in several different arrangements, but I, I want to start with sola scriptura when we get to that point. And dealing with uh, scriptures and the revelation of God, I thought, well, I might just, uh, for your entertainment perhaps, or interest, I was going to read my passage in Ephesians chapter 2. If you can turn there in your Bibles. I was going to read it from my Greek New Testament and tell you how it sounded as Paul uh, quoted it to whoever was writing for him. He usually had somebody else do the writing. Uh, called an amenuensis. But uh, I got out my Greek New Testament and I found out that since I haven't read it for about 30 years, I'd better leave that one alone. I'd be up here stumbling around. <laughs> but as you know, uh, this is a, a memorial of sorts of the work of Martin Luther, my one grandson had over for dinner last night and he's uh, attending a uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church and I said about uh, tomorrow being Reformation Sunday and he said oh yes the Sunday where all Christians become Lutherans <laughs> so, so we're here we're here to commemorate Martin Luther I read something interesting that I had, hadn't heard before that I can remember uh, Dr. Robert Godfrey of Westminster Seminary in California with Ligonier Ministries mentioned that the date that Martin Luther nailed his theses on the church door, that he doesn't believe that Martin Luther was converted yet at that point. So that was in, uh, as you know, October 31st, which was the day before All Saints Day, which is November 1st. And of course, my one granddaughter, who was born November 1st, reminds me that she was born on All Saints Day. So that's significant. But uh, it was two years. This was a challenge for a debate. It was two years before someone answered that challenge. So it was in 1519 when he debated with the Dr. Eck. And then it was another two years. It was in 1521 when the trials took place that we saw on the video there in the conclusion. Luther had been called to Rome, but Prince Frederick wouldn't let him go because he figured he'd never come back if he sent him to Rome. He was excommunicated in 1520. And you probably are aware of the story that uh, on his way to the, um, the final trial, he was kidnapped mysteriously and uh, I, I read today that at least uh, Godfrey believes that it was uh, Prince Frederick who his men who did that and took him and hid him away safely so we want to look at those passages but we're going to read here in Ephesians chapter 2 from 1 through 10 hear the word of the Lord and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Parentheses, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kingdom toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. <coughs> Let us pray and ask for the Lord's help. Thank you, Father, for this time together and for the promise that you would meet with us when we gather together to worship you. Thank you for the word of God, the reading of the word and the ministry of the word. Use me, Lord, to be a blessing, to share divine truths that will build us up in the faith for your glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgot to pour my water here. As you know, I'm dealing with a few physical issues and I call it the COVID hangover. <coughs> this cough that's been hanging on for almost a year now. <coughs> I want to look at, at verse 1 there again. You notice in your Bible, likely, he made alive, or as the King James has it, he quickened, is in italics. And you know what that means, I think. That means it was not in the original text. It was put in there by the translators to give us a hint of where he's going. So he wanted to tie us to verse 5 with that statement. And of course the parentheses there in verse 5, by grace you have been saved, was a parenthetical by Paul to push us ahead, to take a glance ahead to verse 8 is where he's going to bring that thunderbolt to us by the grace of God. Now as I was reading for about the tenth time yesterday morning I did something I, I don't know if I ever did it before. <clears throat> and you the, the Greek says and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. That you is plural of course. He's writing to the church at Ephesus in some manuscripts. The words in Ephesus are not in that manuscript. And so some think it might have been a general epistle since he didn't mention names and so forth at the conclusion. But I put my name in there. And it really blessed me. I don't know if I can do it without getting emotional. And you, William Brantner, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You don't have to do it aloud, but think it. And you, Virginia Brantner, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Whew. That's bad news. That's bad news. That's why the gospel is such good news. Because he starts with this background. He lets us know this is where we all started, every one of us. I remember a preacher one time 
and uh, he was a, an evangelical as the, the term was used there today I might go back and hit on that but <clears throat> he made a statement preaching there are actually two ways to be saved the only problem is one of them doesn't work <laughs> And that, and that one is the one where we try to save ourselves. We can't. That way is by keeping the law. Every shred of it. But there is one who kept the law completely. And so he earned for us the righteousness that we need to come into the presence of God to be saved but it's an ugly situation there and you, I think you all know this this is where we were we were dead dead means dead spiritually God told Adam and Eve in the garden the day you eat of that tree you will surely die <coughs> of course you know how the devil did you will not surely die Adam and Eve died spiritually immediately when they partook of that fruit. He lived another 900 plus years physically, but he died. He was dead spiritually. And this is the condition that every one of us were born with. He passed that original sin onto the human race and we were born in sin. The psalmist said, I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, conceived in sin. <clears throat> in what you once walked, according to the course of this world, and so forth. And then he comes back here in verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So there are the words made alive or quickened is in the Greek text. So verse 1 was just a preview to let us know. Don't despair. There's something good coming. And that's where it is. He made us alive. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to take time to read chapter 1, but if you're familiar with chapter 1, he talks there to the last part of the chapter about the power by which he raised Christ from the dead. And it is that same power that it raises us from our deadness spiritually. He quickens us. He brings us to life from death. Now, how can a dead person make themselves alive again? They can't. They can't. Somebody else would have to do it. And so he quickens us. He raises us up together and makes us sit together in heavenly places. Sound familiar? Back in chapter 1, verse 3, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace <clears throat> and in, in, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We're talking about some grace here, some tremendous grace. And then he says, for by grace you have been saved. And so I put my name in there. For by grace, Bill Brenner, William Brenner, there's three of us Bills around, you have been saved. Now in, in the Greek, that is what's called a, uh, an aorist participle. It means that you have been being saved. Something happened in the past and it is, has current present results and it's going to continue on throughout eternity. You are in a saved condition. There was a point of time where it happened. You might know the point in time. I can't remember the point of time. I, I believe I was converted at be almost nine years old, about eight years old, in the summer, right before my birthday. And I don't know what day and what time and so on and so forth. But that's when I was brought to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, there's a little disagreement on what that, that refers back to. And most of us, I believe, think it's talking about faith. That faith is not of yourself. But there's others who say, and the Greek structure allows either way, there's others who say he's talking about the whole package of salvation. Called and chosen and justified and sanctified and glorified the whole nine yards. And it's true for both. Because faith is part of that package. By grace are you saved. You have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. <coughs> Salvation is of the Lord, not of men. It is the gift of God. The whole shebang is a gift of God. The whole, all the works that compose salvation. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, speaking of works, what about works? Well, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I don't know if any of you had chemistry and had the little uh, equations for chemistry and you have sodium plus uh, chlorine. It doesn't say equal, but there's an arrow that says yields sodium chloride. I see a couple of heads nodding. That they know that. The Roman Catholic Church views salvation is that justification plus work, or, I'm sorry, faith plus works yields salvation. The Protestant view is faith yields salvation plus works. The works belong there. It's part of the salvation package. But it's the fruit of it. Faith is the root. Works are the fruit. So sola scriptura. Sola, sola gracia, sola fida, sola Christus, sola Deo gloria. We see those solas in this passage as well as in the very beginning of the book of Ephesians in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Right there is the, the scriptures given. God used holy men of old, bearing them along in the power of the Holy Spirit. The foundation of the church, further down in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So sola scriptura means that the scripture is the only source of authority for Christians and for the church. This book is the only source for doctrine and faith that God gave to mankind. Now, I, this is a, a big book, a gift to me from the past since I didn't have a New King James Version. And I like this. I shouldn't say how much I like it. He might want some money for it. <clears throat> it's got all kind of comments and maps and so on and so forth. So I dug this guy out. I bought a few of these one time. This is the whole Bible in large print. And I, I can read it without my glasses even. It has a concordance and it has some maps in it. Right here. This little book. Is all that God gave us for doctrine in the church. This little book. Now, do you think this tells us everything there is to know about God? Hardly. The Apostle John said if he would have tried to write everything that Jesus said and did, the books would have filled the whole earth, and some take that as a uh, hyperbole. An exaggeration, but think about it. He is the eternal, infinite God. 
But this book, and that's, that's King James Version, so I'll hold up the, this book tells us everything we need to know about God to be saved, sanctified, glorified, to live a holy life pleasing to God. It has it all right there. <clears throat> That's what Sola Scriptura is all about. That the Word of God, Scriptures alone, because the Roman Catholic Church would bring in the statements of the popes, the infallibility of the popes, uh, church councils, like the Vatican councils, and so on and so forth. And so the, the reformer says, no, the Word of God is the only source for doctrine. Now, that's not all that we know about God. God has revealed himself, as uh, Pastor Jeff there read this morning from uh, Romans chapter 1, he has revealed himself to us in our very nature, in our being, as we're created in his image. He has created us, and that's why that men are without excuse if they reject him. Because he's already revealed himself to them, and they took that knowledge and they repressed it. And they pushed it down and buried it, because they didn't want anything to do with it. And he's revealed himself in the creation. Everywhere we look around about us, we see the handiwork of God. The more we look, I was telling my grandson last night, I said, the more technology we get, the more powerful the telescopes, the more powerful the microscopes, we discover things that are just mind-blowing. Things that are mind-blowing. And we come into areas like the, uh, various dimensions and, and tiny particles, one they call the God particle, some little tiny particle in the nucleus of an atom. We can't fathom it. We see there the power and the majesty and the wisdom of God. And all men see that. That, that message cries out, says the psalmist, to mankind day after day. All human beings hear that voice of God. They see his power and wisdom around them day by day. But that revelation of God, a natural revelation, a general revelation, does not tell us what I must do to be saved. So we had to have a special revelation and God gave us his word. And God did it miraculously through the apostles and the prophets, speaking through them. All scripture is given by inspiration. Every word, every, every particle of the words is inspired by God. And that's what the reformers came back to. They, they got away, they, they tried to take the church back to the apostolic time of the church. That the scriptures alone is the sole source of authority, not the Pope, not the councils. And they rejected the notion that God gives revelation apart from scripture to the church. The Bible is complete. It is finished. And, of course, the Roman Catholic Church would add to it. And there's some churches today that add to it. It, it uh, rejects that idea. And it also rejects the idea of the church being the supreme and always correct interpreter of Scripture. So that's another blessing that God has given us, that we can come to the Word of God. It's one of the results that we had because of the um, uh, Reformation. The church returned to the apostolic church. Number one, in the preaching of the word as the gospel of salvation by grace alone. The salvation did not come through the church. The Roman Catholic Church believes that salvation is in the church. Like your money in a bank. Some of you have, maybe have a lot of that. In, I don't know. You want some of that money, you go into the bank and you go up to the teller and you tell them, I want to withdraw $100. And if that's what you got in there, they'll they'll give you that hundred dollars. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church 
views salvation. As you go through the seven sacraments and you do penance and you go to mass and, and so on and so forth, you're drawing money out of the bank. You're drawing something of salvation. You never get the whole shebang. That's why they have purgatory. And that's why they had the indulgences. Because, you know, if uh, Uncle Joe's soul was in purgatory, uh, they can charge you indulgences so that they can pray that his time in purgatory would be shorter. And uh, so you never, you never really realize salvation in this life. And so they went back to the preaching of the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they done away with the worship of images, the veneration of relics. If you know what they are, Prince, uh, uh, who was it? Edward, had a collection of like 3,000 or 5,000 relics at his castle. So, and people, and that's why uh, uh, there were so many people on, uh, near the church there on October 31st, 1517, they would make pilgrimages to see these relics. You know, a piece of hair, uh, maybe milk from Mary's breast, a piece of wood splinter from the cross, and they would get down and they would bow down to these, uh, to these items. So they, they'd done away with all this. Uh, holy water, prayers to the dead, the doctrine of purgatory, the mass. As I said, the, rabbi, the Catholic Church had seven sacraments. The Reformers kept two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then a second result was the priesthood of all believers. Every believer is a priest of God and can, can go directly to God. You don't need to go and confess sins to a priest. There is no other intercessor, no other mediator, including Mary. They could go directly to God and they become members of the true church when they become believers. And then thirdly, a result, the church was an organism, a living body where all believers are members. But it cannot dispense grace. Grace comes only from God. The church can, of course, make use of the means of grace. Preaching of the word, prayer, reading of the scriptures. These are means of grace. Fellowship with the saints. They are means of grace through which God operates to deal out his grace to us. But the church does not have the power to dispense grace. And then this fourth Principal scriptures alone are the infallible authority for faith and practice. And every individual has a right of private interpretation. That's one you don't hear about that often. Every believer has the right of private interpretation. You read the Bible, the Spirit of God, we have, a, as, as uh, John said in one of his general epistles, we have an unction from the Holy One. We have the privilege and the right because we, every one of us must give account of ourselves to God. Everyone must give account of himself to God. To me, that's one of the scariest verses of the Bible. So it's not the, the idea of I'm going to lose my salvation, but I've got to give account of every word I've said, of how I handled the word of God. So I don't have to agree with you on how you understand the passage. I have the right of private interpretation, but if I'm wise, I'm going to see what some other godly people had to say about that passage. Because we've got to give account for it if we're wrong. So you have the right to disagree with the church. But it carries a, a great weight of responsibility with that. So you better make sure you do your homework. So sola scriptura, the word of God is it. That is our source of doctrine. And then sola gratia, by grace alone. There is nothing in us whereby God would choose us because of that. There's nothing in us. 
We are saved purely by his grace. Now he has his reasons for choosing who he does. But we don't know that. There's nothing in me. You read what we are like. You read it right there with me. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to, to the prince of the power of the air and the, the, the ways of this world, sons of disobedience, lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. There is nothing there. We're rotten. We're rotten to the core. And we cannot be saved unless God makes the first move. And he does that by quickening us, by giving us life, resurrecting us from spiritual death, and then giving us, as the book of Acts says, the gift of faith unto repentance. You can't even repent without faith. The gift of faith. That's all by the grace of God. As we read through those passages there, it was mentioned so many times uh, uh, that he might show the riches of his grace. It's by God's grace and God alone. Sola gratia. The sola fide we'll look at here in a minute is the human experiential side where we reach out and take the gift. But grace is the Godward side where he hands us the gift. The gift of faith, the gift of salvation, justification. So God turns to man and accepts him even though he is unacceptable. How could that be? Because of Christ and his righteousness. The theology of the cross of Paul's preaching covers the entire life. It's all by grace. Justification, sanctification, glorification is all by the grace of God. Sola gratia. And then sola fida. Faith alone. Works result from the faith. We cannot earn the righteousness that we need. In fact, this is what drove Luther to the point of his salvation, his conversion, actually in, in uh, Romans 1.17, where he read the quotation of Paul from Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith and the righteousness of God that is revealed. And Luther, it dawned on him then, I can never reach that stage of righteousness that is needed for me to please God. I can't reach that. But Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. So this is what faith is all about. By faith, we believe that on the cross, Jesus bore my sins. I see it as he bore my sins. The punishment, the guilt, God laid it all on him. I deserved it. God laid it all on him. And then he kept the law to the letter. So that righteousness, pure righteousness, God takes and puts that on me. And he accepts me like that is actually my righteousness. This is not mine. It's the righteousness of Christ that he clothes me with. You're not going to get into heaven without that righteousness covered by the righteousness of Christ. And faith believes that. That's all there is to it. That's the gospel. Faith believes that is true. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, I like the begotten, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how simple it is. That's the work of faith. 
Faith alone, you can't earn it. We've already blown it. We were born in sin. We deserved hell from the time we were born. We deserve nothing but eternal punishment. But by faith, I can believe that God chose me before the foundation of the world. He knew all the wicked things that I have done. He knew all the things that I'm going to continue to do until I die. And he took all that and he punished his son for me. And then he took his 100% righteousness and purity and he put that on my account. And that's how he treats me. And that's, that's why I can go to him in Jesus' name. Ask anything, Jesus told his disciples, in my name, and I will do it. We come in his name. We become part of him. We are in union with Christ. And it's all by faith. And that is, as he says, the gift of God. It's all a gift of God. Faith alone. Works are there, but they follow it. God ordained it that way. In fact, if you don't have works, there's something wrong with your faith. Faith is alone, but the faith that justifies is not alone, as R.C. Sproul said. It does produce works. We have faith in the works of Christ. Christ did the work. So, you know, there was an expression here several years ago, what would Jesus do? R.C. Sproul wrote a book that said, what did Jesus do? That's what we need to preach and understand. What did Jesus do? He took our place. We cannot be good enough to get into heaven. We can't. But he was good enough and is good enough. And he died in our place. So faith is a hand that received the gift of God's grace. Faith in his works. Trust in what he has done. It's that simple. As I said, um, when we were being interviewed there about membership, a quote from Spurgeon, someone asked him, this great theologian and preacher, can you summarize your theology? What statement would you give to Christians? And his simple statement was, Jesus died for me. And I, I told my wife, I said, Any, anytime somebody starts asking you to explain how do you know that you're saved, can you give me an argument here, this and that? Yeah. All you need is Jesus died for me. That's what faith is. Jesus died for me. William Eugene Brantner. He died for me. He took my place. I was dead. He brought me to life. I was lost. But he sent, extended his grace to me and forgave me of my sins and sent his Holy Spirit into my heart and to my life. Sola Christus, Christ alone, his righteousness, not ours. He's the only mediator. There are no other mediators between God and man, but the man Christ Jesus. And then finally, Sola Deo Gloria. <laughs> Who's gonna take any of the glory? It's all a gift from God. The whole business from beginning to end before the foundations of the world. He had predestined us. How are you going to boast about that? His grace reached out. It's all of grace. And it's by faith which you can't even conjure up on your own. It, because you're dead for one thing before you're converted. You're dead. You can't believe. You can't change your own heart. And so God brings that to us. So all the glory has to go to him. And that's what's brought out in the passage there. It's the gift of God, not of works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He made, raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us for his glory. For his glory. That's what gets me nervous about a lot of these 
actors on the stages of the churches today getting applauses. A lot of times they'll be applauding these singers and whistling and everything. And I'll be my sarcastic self and say, yes, glory to that person. All praise and glory be to that person. Instead of the hallelujahs and the amens. So all the glory goes to God. These were the principles brought to us from the Reformation. And of course, Luther, you know, uh, on his way, I, I was telling our brother here this morning that I heard uh, a couple of days ago for the first time that uh, from Wittenberg to the, where the Diet of Worms was, was over 300 miles. And so Luther would have taken him about two weeks to get there with his little caravan and whatever. He had a lot of time to think this thing over. And as far as he knew, uh, he was going to die. He was going to die and he made that stand. I can do nothing else. His faith was in the word of God. It's that simple. He just stood firm on the faith of the word of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these reminders of these great tenets of the faith brought to us by the time of the Reformation, but down through the centuries. But we've drifted so far. We've drifted so far, Lord. Help us to see the need to pray for a change, Reformation style, in the church today. To raise up godly leaders who will not compromise, who will take a stand even if it's for their own life. To bring truth into all the pulpits again. To preach the truth of God's grace, being justified by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. May we take these truths with us and be a blessing to us in Christ's name. Amen.